Good afternoon, this is Jen, the Liberty Lion, and today I'm going to go over a paper here. This is not a paper that was written in the United States, however, the ideas within it being legal apply in many different places. So what he's saying here applies also in America, the United States, as well as other countries because the legal system basically works the same everywhere. So this is Journal of Institutional Economics, Legal Persons, the Evolution of Fictitious Species, Ugo, Cobano, uh, Ugo Pagano, University of Siena, Siena, Italy, and Central European University, University Budapest, Hungary. Again, um, this is not a paper written in the United States. However, what they're saying about legal persons apply basically everywhere. <clears throat> the abstract is Posner considers purposeful organizations. Legal persons are fictitious, non-mortal species whose evolution has played a major role in economic development. In what sense can they be said to have a purpose? Thanks to several important mutations, the status of legal persons was transferred from public bodies to business corporations. This evolutionary journey is complementary to the uh, Cozian view, which moving in the opposite direction explains the firm as a centralization of market transactions. If the corporation emerged also from a process of decentralization of public attributes, some features of public legal persons are lacking in its business mutation. Also, some ways of motivating people are only available to the original species. Introduction. In this stimulating article, Posner in 2010 concentrates on those particular institutions that are supposed to have a purpose. Even if various interests live together in an organization, there are usually some individuals who can take decisions on their behalf. These individuals may be more or less numerous, and one interesting contribution of the paper is its analysis on how decentralized decision-making can be made compatible with the goals of the organization. Not all institutions are organizations. Markets are not. And not all organizations are legal persons. The mafia is not. However, Posner focuses on three types of organizations. Business corpor corporations, intelligence agencies, and judiciary, which are legal persons. Some individuals are supposed to act on behalf of the organization, which assumes all sorts of legal positions independently of its members. An interesting point in Posner's analysis is that business corporations may find it more difficult than other organizations to achieve consistency between their stated goals and those of the individuals taking the decisions on their behalf. In this moment, I shall try to show how some features of the concept of legal persons can explain some of the interesting puzzles considered by Posner. Legal persons are fictitious, Fuller, 1967, species created by humankind. I'd like to mention here that I have videos on um, Lawn Fuller's Legal Persons or Legal Fictions, which is a book you can find on the internet. And he references in the beginning of his book, the 1930s articles from one of the law institutes where they talk about these fictitious persons or legal fictions. The birth certificate creates a legal fiction. You create a fictitious name for your child and you record the document in a legal state, which is a fictitious state, so that that child can do business with or be contracted with by 
those corporations registered to do business with the federal government, including the federal government, which are the various instrumentalities or instruments which George Washington in his farewell speech said also, just like Eisenhower, basically to beware the military um, instruments. There are subjects to forms of selection and to the speciation of new types, numerous species of legal persona exist in contemporary economics. I'm not going to read the whole article to you, but I just want to point out some things to you. He says, although legal persons have the appealing status of non-mortal individuals, they may find it rather difficult to adapt and sometimes even to survive when environmental change requires multiple complementary adjustments. The quest for non-mortal species. At least since Adam Smith, economist, have been aware that humans have a natural tendency to barter, to engage in exchanges, and eventually to create markets. This view has been extended to the sphere of the social contract. Before Adam Smith, Hobbes saw the power of the absolute sovereign as the outcome of a contract, and the tradition continued until Rawls' application of an analogous bargain to the realm of social justice. So uh, our entire system in America is based on contracts between legal persons or legal entities. And here we see in a minute that he's going to call the state a legal person. Although market exchanges have been seen as the founding institution of human civilization, a full-blown market economy could not have evolved if all the actors in the market economy had been ordinary human persons. Humans do not always respect the deals they make. There is one obvious precondition that is difficult to enforce, that the individuals who have made the deals must be still alive. So this takes us back to what Thomas Jefferson said, where he said that the world must belong to the living. When all we have are banks and banks own everything, the world belongs to the dead. So in order to keep the world belonging to the living, debt should only be contracted for a certain number of years. And after that number of years, there should be no, no debt after that. And the number of years would be 19 because that was the, that was the, the, the length of time of one generation. And then so the father could leave his land to his son and his son would not be responsible for the debts of his father since humans are alive and the debt has to belong to the living. And then when after 19 years, there's no more debt because the land has to be transferred to the offspring, the son, and then the son takes care of the land and lives off the land. So if the son in high, uh, inherits the father's debt, then the debt can keep on um, perpetuating, getting bigger and bigger. And so the debt would never end. And that would mean that the land could never be lived on by the living because it's always being, something is always owed to someone else. So then the land belongs to the dead. And so the earth would belong to the dead. So the earth belonging to the dead has to do with having too much debt. Human fragility is a very serious problem for ensure, ensuring that deals are kept. One would prefer to make them with persons who belong to non-mortal species. These fictitious species have in fact been invented and they form the family tree of legal persons. They include the business corporation, national security agencies, and national judiciaries, which are the focus of Posner's analysis. So what they're saying is that these corporations and these judiciaries have to live on forever because they're, um, they're overseeing contracts 
And if they live forever, they can't be real humans, so they have to be legal fictions. Legal persons can make long-lasting deals as holders of rights, duties, powers, and liabilities. And to me, when I read this, it's really just an excuse to allow the earth to become the property of the dead because debt and the dead go hand in hand. Um, corporations that never die go hand in hand. There's also um, ancient philosophy that says a corporation should exist only for the purpose of achieving a means to an end for a particular thing. Once the end is done or achieved, the corporation should end. And then the people that need to erect the corporation again, they would erect it for themselves. And so any corporation, any constitution, any law would only exist for that generation who made it. And when that generation dies, those corporations, those constitutions, those laws, they die with those people. And I believe that's why the government, the federal government is constantly needing people to sign papers because it keeps, it keeps the law and the constitution perpetual. It keeps it going because the new generation is signing up to be a part of it. Because of these interlocking, interlocking characteristics, the evolution from common law to civil law systems is blocked. And each system has at most a local efficiency where each characteristic is optimally adjusted to the other in the same way as the stomach of a lion is adjusted to its powerful mouth and the digestive system of a swallow is adjusted to its tiny beak. Simple organisms like bacteria and, and other small animals can quickly mutate and adjust to the environment, but only at the cost of foregoing the advantages of complexity. The organizations considered by Posner and in general most legal personae are not organisms of this simple kind. Their non-mortality is usually obtained at the cost of some complexity. Persons and half-persons. The constitution or the uh, characteristics of legal persons has been the outcome of a long process. The state was the first legal person and some fundamental conditions for the working of the market economy could only be guaranteed by such a non-mortal entity so to me when i see this i see that the wealthy are perpetually wealthy and their children are wealthy because they're contracted with the federal government and the states as corporations so walmart is handed down from one generation to the next generation of their children and so this complexity guarantees that it lives forever. But really what should happen is that Walmart as a corporation should die and because it's doing business with the federal government and it's gaining an advantage over other corporations, it should die and then the new generation should be able to build something of their own. Stable jurisdiction required long lasting set, uh, setters and enforcers of rules. However, it was legal pluralism that created the conditions for Western civilization and, in particular, the plurality of legal persons existing in the European Middle Ages. So legal, plural, uh, legal pluralism, what I understand, is having many corporations. So we have um, the Federal Reserve that wants to contract with us, the IRS that wants to contract with us, the um, Department of Public Safety wants us to contract with it. The Motor Vehicle Department wants us to contract with it. All of these are separate corporations that want to contract with us. That's legal pluralism the way I understand it to be. In spite of their conflicts, these organizations recognize that their own jurisdiction, meaning their own power and their own authority, was somehow limited by the jurisdiction of the other legal persons. Accordingly, the European late Middle Ages was characterized by a common legal order comprising diverse legal systems, church versus crown, crown versus town, town versus lord, lord versus merchant. 
Within this framework, new legal persons, the universities, became necessary to study the correct adjudication of jurisdictions. And of course, today we have the, the universities and colleges which teach um, the benefits of all these legal persons and these corporations, which amounts to nothing less than a monopoly through the federal government, which keeps the rich rich. The independent legal personality of universities guaranteed the autonomy of scholars and the solution of disputes by the means of open debates using Greek logic, Holy Christian scriptures, and the Justinian Code. Justinian Code is really interesting to read if you want some neat stuff to read. It has a lot of natural law in it. The Western tradition of legal pluralism was challenged by the emergence of national states, but it never died away. American legal pluralism became even stronger with the federal constitution when American states had to engage in the production of public utilities they granted some typical advantage of state organizations such as legal personhood and limited liability to mixed organizations involving also the participation of private actors. The chartered corporations Okay, these are all the corporations that are doing business with and through the federal government, particularly controlled by the state. Of course, we have dependent states, which are non-sovereign states, and which are the military areas, and then independent states, which are the original states. Made an important contribution to the early American development. The chartered corporation evolved into the modern corporation, the main mutations included its privatization. So we have what we call these quasi-public-private instrumentalities ran by the federal government, such as the Federal Reserve, and the erosion of the state's power to grant incorporation. The constitution of the independent corporate legal personality became possible without the state's intervention and the act of incorporation. Okay, the business corporation ended up having a legal personhood similar to that of other public organizations. The weak identity of the corporation is confirmed by the fact that it is devoid of fundamental human rights, such as self-ownership. Okay, so we can look at this in connection with um, Lawn Fuller's legal fictions and think about if you want to take this and read this as far as markets and economy goes, you think about this and the social contract instituted in the United States where it requires or says that by law you're supposed to or you have to sign all these documents so that it can do business with you as your legal person named on your birth certificate so that it can contract with you to take take from you, to take money from you, to use you, to use your labor, to benefit itself under this um, pretend social contract. As if you can't do for yourself, so it has to do for you, but in order to do for you, you have to agree. You agree by signing the contract, which is a voluntary positive act. When you sign a contract, it's called a voluntary positive act. You make it a law for you. So you're contracting in with these various quote unquote federal instrumentalities, which are acting as a public business, but also as a private business. Kind of a middleman for the federal government because the federal government can't actually do it itself because it has to stay within the constitution. So it gets these middlemen, these instrumentalities, such as the IRS to act as a public corporation so that it can contract with you and take the money from you. There are certain people who do have to pay federal taxes. And so when it says you have to pay, it's not talking about people who don't have to pay. It's talking about people who do have to pay. But once you sign the contract, then you're obligated to pay because you've signed a contract, which is a W-4. Non-mortal legal persons and impersonal public authority, for example, example, favor the development of markets. Legal persons are a complex family of fictitious species 
And as Posner illustrates, they have complementary characteristics that are adjusted to each other. Originally, traditional legal persons were public organizations with well-defined identities. Transferring these characteristics to business organizations has been a long and difficult evolutionary process. So really the bigs, when they talk about the bigs, those, these big corporations, the bigger they get, the bigger they get, and they just keep growing and growing and growing. This is sort of like the evolutionary process that's taken place through these corporations that just allow them to just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then through the government, they're constantly given bailouts, but they're really just legal persons. They're fictitious beings, fictitious persons, fictitious entities, corporations. They're non-mortal. They don't, they're not alive. They're not living. Um, they're just there for you to contract with so it can take your money and use your money as it sees fit. Now, to me, in my opinion, because this is a fictitious system, it has grown way faster because it doesn't abide by the laws of nature. It has allowed itself to grow way faster than it can actually keep up with itself. So it can't keep up with its own growth. And this is why I believe we're going to see a um, another recession, possibly depression in the economy because this has been artificial growth. It's grown too fast. It's grown too much. It's used all these artificial means, all these non-real ways to do business um, to grow itself. And it's grown so fast that we can't keep up with it. And it wants more and more. It's like a hungry machine. It just wants more and more and more. And we're not going to be able to keep up with it as natural humans. We can only produce so much. We can only work so much, but it needs more than we can give it to continue to survive. So as a result, it's going to have to contract. And I think this is what people are trying to say to us. And so many people can't understand it because nobody's really explaining it in a way that, um, in, in a variety of ways, because people learn in so many different ways. So what we're doing here is we're trying to understand this artificial growth through all these um, fictitious means to allow something small to get bigger and bigger and bigger really fast. And because it's gotten so big so fast, our ability to produce and work cannot keep up with it. And as a result, it's going to have to contract. It's just going to have to. And the more we put it off, like kicking the can down the road, as they say, it's going to have to contract a lot more than it would if we had just stopped and took care of this a long time ago or even never let this get out of hand as Thomas Jefferson says keep the earth within the sphere of belonging to the living belonging to the natural people and the natural law so that it never gets so far out of hand that when it contracts that it doesn't result in a recession or a depression or a great depression Okay, so a natural growth can result in a natural contraction, but they're small. They're very small. An unnatural growth is going to have to result in a very hard contraction, a, a, a huge contraction, because it's grown so fast, it's going to have to contract really fast. And there's going to be no way to really keep up with it. So again, this is a neat little article um and i'm still finding a lot of people who don't know about this stuff who don't realize that there's such a thing as a legal fiction or legal person or legal entity and all these things and what all this stuff means so please consider liking sharing subscribing uh download the article read it for yourself try to talk about it with your friends your neighbors people at the coffee shop this is only a few pages long you can even um, print it off and hand it to people or uh, email it to people this is nothing new let's see this article was written in 2010 
It's nothing new. Like I said, Lon Fuller, um, Legal Fictions, the book is available online. Uh, he was he was rewriting something that was written in the 1930s. And there are other books that state that in early Roman time, whenever they started creating for the first time these legal fictions, that they knew what they were doing was wrong because they were acting outside of nature. And Thomas Jefferson told us that too. Okay, so again, like, share, subscribe, and you guys have a great day.